Coming back to the New Testament, to one of the epistles, uh, one of uh, the letters that the Apostle Paul wrote. And we're going to the book of Colossians. It's interesting because so many of the other books, uh, Ephesians, Galatians, and Philippians, and so on and so forth, that Paul was actually instrumental in, in starting the church. He was there, but you're going to see uh, that he did not start the church at Colossae. He was not even there, but yet uh, it seems that Epiphras, um, that you read in chapter 1, verse 7, I'm just giving you a little background here that no doubt he was the one that started the church started preaching and the individuals came in and then they ran into a little crisis or a big crisis and uh, Epiphras he solicited the help of the seasoned war um, individual the Apostle Paul that was there and so uh, uh, Paul wrote a letter to them, and so we're grateful for that also. Stand, if you would, Colossians chapter 2, and we're going to go to verse uh, 1, and we're going to read down 2 and through verse 3. If you've been watching uh, AJ's and Gwen uh, there too, I know that Caden has... Uh, you know, just having a little more difficult time this past week. So uh, I don't need to remind you to keep praying for him, that little guy. And so we're so thankful for him. And let's continue to pray. Colossians chapter 2, beginning at verse 1. We're going to read verse 2 and verse 3. But as I always say, keep your Bibles open because that's not all we're going to be talking to to get the whole scope of what's going on on, uh, we need to look at some other things too. Colossians chapter 2 verse 1. For I would, Paul says, that you knew what great conflict I have for you. Now Paul understands the conflict and the chaos and the crisis that this church is in. And so he's writing to them. He's interceding. He's praying for them. He said, come on, guys. You can do it. You can make it. And he said also for all of them at Laodicea, which was within the same general area of where Colossae was, and for as many notice as have not not seen my face in the flesh. But he says, that your hearts, here's what I'm struggling. Here's what I'm engaged in this spiritual battle on your behalf for. I, I'm believing God that your hearts might be comforted, being knit together in love, and into all riches of the full assurance of understanding to the acknowledgement of the the mystery of God and of the Father and of Christ. And just mentioning Christ, verse 3, in whom, in Jesus Christ, are hid all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. And the church said, Amen. Amen. You may be seated. I want to talk a little bit this morning on strong in crisis or strong in crises if you have more than one that is going on in your life. But strong in time of crisis. As we look at this passage of Scripture and as I begin to think about my own life and Cynthia and my life over the many, many years now, you know, I, I thought of this, and we know this, that the real measure of an individual is not the strength that is exuded or exemplified when everything is going well. 
But the real measure of an individual is the strength that they exemplify in their heart when everything is not going well. In fact, in the midst of crises, and a, an individual crisis is. And so the time when the wheels have begun to come off, the time when even in an airplane in mid-flight, the engines conk out and cease to run. I'm talking about in a time of chaos, confusion, and corruption, and confrontation, and calamity. Could I go on and on and on? It is during those times that we need to stand the strongest, and it's during those times when strength is exemplified in the greatest fashion. Now, as I've already alluded here, that, that which prompted Paul to write this letter in the first place is that the church at Colossae had their own uh, crisis going on. And really, to give it to you in a nutshell, we're going to look at some of the scriptures here of what Paul says that is, but I'm still in the introduction here of where we want to get with this. Uh, but, but basically here, these are Gentiles. These are people that the gospel did not originally go out, which was originally to the Jews. And now as more Gentiles, uh, non-Jewish people, are becoming saved. Uh, they're coming out of all kinds of religions and worship of idols and philosophies and ideologies of man. And especially around this area here, it was all about like we would think of New Age and of wisdom and knowledge and uh, you know I've come up with this or that and, and this is going to lead you into a, a deeper walk in your life a better knowing of yourself and on and on and on it goes but but so so Paul is saying here that that look you have gotten saved <coughs> Excuse me. The Lord Jesus Christ has brought you out of all of that. And, and you're doing good. But these individuals, false teachers, they're not going to go down without a fight. And so what they had done, they were going back to these new Christians in the Lord. And they were trying to discourage them. They were saying, the gospel and this individual Christ... <laughs> that you are following is not the true Messiah. And you left the truth to go to this. And so, sorry folks. <clears throat> And so you've left all of this and you need to come back. You need to come back. And so Paul says, you know, you're doing well. But I'm sure that under the bombardment of this continual that you're wrong and you need to come back, uh, that maybe some of them were kind of losing, losing faith. Some of them were uh, kind of begin asking questions. Is that right? Is this Christianity thing for me? Is this serving God uh, really for me? <coughs> To give you a little bit of a summary of what Paul's talking about, if you'll skip down, if your Bibles are still open, notice what he says in verse 8. And I'll take it a little slower here. He said, Beware lest any man spoil you. Now that is that any man corrupt you. Any man that would try to get you to go back. And God forbid that he's successful in that. And then he says, here's how that he's trying to get you to go back. Uh, go back, if you will, to your philosophy. And then he said, vain deceit. And thirdly, after the tradition of men. And then fourthly, after the rudiments of the world. And he said, notice, not after Christ. 
So he said, here, you, before you got saved, you, there was these philosophies and ideologies of men that you were involved in. And then he goes on and he said, vain deceit. Anything of a lie, anything that is an untruth, and it comes against the real truth, which is the written word of God and the living word of God which is Jesus Christ. And then he said the traditions of men. Now look, a tradition of man can be either good or bad. It depends upon what it's based upon. If it's based upon the truth or it doesn't actually come against the truth, then uh, that's fine if men have that tradition in their own family or in their own group or whatever they do. But Paul's talking about traditions that come against the truth of the Word of God. And you see, it doesn't doesn't matter how long it's been a tradition. You know, I've been in places and churches and they said, Pastor, we've always done it this way since we began. Well, it doesn't matter if you have. If it's wrong, it's still wrong now when it was when you first started. So longevity does not make it right. It's whether it goes against the truth or not. And then the last one, the rudiments of the world, these individuals in, in this misty kind, and that's what Paul's even talking their language here, kind of like this mysticism, a higher knowledge and wisdom. And, and if you will do these things, you will reach that, that level. But they believed anyway, they believed that there were spirits that influenced the heavenly body. Uh, and bodies such as the moon, the stars, and the sky. And that you could predict your future by looking to the stars. Sound familiar? Astrology. That's basically what he's referring to here. That you look to these things instead of looking to the Word of God. You go to psychics and you go to, uh, you know, fortune tellers and uh, to read <coughs> uh, the cards and to look into the stars. And, <coughs> and so on and so forth. But if you go back in the verse 1, Paul, or chapter 1 rather, Paul says, you're doing great. Just hang in there. And notice what he says in chapter 1, 4, and 5. Paul said, I've never met you, but I've heard about three things here. I've heard about the great faith that you have in Christ in verse 4, and the love which you have to all the saints, not only to God, but to each other. And then fifthly, or thirdly, but in verse 5, he said, for the hope which is laid up for you in heaven. So Paul said, I've never met you, but everywhere people go in this area, they're talking about you and this. <coughs> I am so sorry, folks. Uh, and Paul is saying that, uh, you know, you're doing well. So just keep at it. Now, what I, what I, what I want to get at here is that Paul said, yeah, you are in a crisis. But I want to give you some things that you need to be doing as a church. And you need to be doing as a church in relationship to each other. That how many times in a crisis it's so easy to isolate yourself and it's, you know, the ideology or the ideas, every man or woman for themselves, dog eat dog and that kind of thing. That's not how the church operates. In a time of crises uh, is when we come together and we are to be a blessing one to the other in any way that we can. And so that's what I want to talk about here. We're in our own crises. You are in maybe a personal crisis yourself. And Paul says, if you're going to survive, let me give you some things that will help you to do that in the midst of the crisis where you can remain strong in the chaos, in the confusion, 
and in the crisis. The first thing that I want to draw to your attention, and we're going to begin our outline there in verse 2, because that's where most of them are referenced. But the first thing that I want to give to you is assurance. Church, we need to assure each other in the midst of crisis, everything is going to be all right. Now, does that mean it's going to turn out the way that I want it to every time? No, uh, because we're not sure what God's wisdom is. And, and God, uh, in the divine scheme of all things, how it's going to fit in there. But, but, but regardless whether it works out the, the way we want it or the time in which we want it, uh, uh, people want to know that everything's going to be okay. And in Christ, it is. Notice what Paul says in verse 2. Uh, here's what I'm, I'm believing God for. Here's what I'm, I'm contending in this spiritual battle that your hearts, and I'm reading now the King James, might be comforted. If you have another translation, some of them put encouragement in there that your hearts would be encouraged. Others put strength that your hearts might be strengthened. And really, the idea, even the word that I'm using here, uh, that your, your, your faith and, and everything about you and your hearts might be reassured, might be assured, and uh, that uh, everything is all right. We're going to make it. And God is right here with us. Now look, folks. Every one of us, it doesn't matter the one amongst us that has been serving God the longest or somebody that is relatively new in the Christian faith. It does not matter. We all go through times when we need encouragement. We need somebody to just come along beside us, put their arm around us and say, look... God's in control. I don't have the answers, but everything truly is going to work itself out. And God is the one, as we preached last week, that is going to do the working out. And as the children this morning about uh, being in church, the, the little message that was given about being in church. You see, church, that's the great part of being a part of a church and being faithful to the church services is because when you go through a difficult time and crisis, that's not the time to separate yourself from the rest. That's the time to get in there because you see the church, the church, and when I say the church, I'm not talking about the building, but I'm talking about the individuals, each and every one of you that are an integral part uh, you see, you may be the one that God will utilize to speak a word of encouragement to somebody else that is going through something very difficult. And the way that God works is we don't even have to know what they're going through. But if we're sensitive to the Lord, open my eyes, Lord. I want to see you. Open my my ears, Lord. I want to be able to hear you. And the Lord can give you a word in which you can speak faith and confidence and encouragement and assurance and lift them up. I tell you what, it's, it's nothing any better than to know that you're part of a group and when you go through something, you're not going to go through it alone. Praise God. Yes. You're not going to have to carry this burden by yourself. 
as I said, to come along putting an arm around you, but what about sidling up beside you and you putting your arm around them and around another and they carry you as it were. Uh, assurance. No, you're not going to have to go through the crisis alone. And so those individuals that separate themselves in a time of crisis, it's not going to get better. It's only going to get worse because as we come together is how that we're able to encourage. Paul said, I'm praying for you. I'm interceding for you. And uh, you know, you could go all the way down the line that whatever it is, uh, do you know that churches have been known to help uh, even uh, fellow believers financially? Uh, how many has ever heard uh, of a Pentecostal handshake? And uh, that what we refer to that just a couple of the old timers. Uh, and what that simply is, uh, is God speaks to you and said, I want you to give a certain, certain amount to another brother or sister in the church. And, and you write out the check or you put the cash in your hand and you go up and shake hands and they feel something in the hand and you transfer it unto them and they just take it and you say, God bless you. The Lord spoke to my heart and uh, I just want to be a blessing. That's what it's all about, church. We're in this thing together. And so Paul here, he's not just writing to individuals. I want you to be individually strong in the midst of chaos and confusion. But Paul is saying, I want you as a group, I want you as a church to be strong. And you, you will be strong if you will encourage each other. Do you know there's a gift of encouragement? No, I'm not talking about the nine supernatural gifts, but the Bible talks about various giftedness. There is a gift of encouragement. Have you ever been around some people that just being with them, they exude encouragement? And then have you ever been around other people that just exude misery? Let's move on. <laughs> Paul said, you need to assure one another. But there's something else you need to agree one with the other. Now, he's not talking about in your personal lives that you may not like the suit I have on today. You would never wear it and so on and so forth. He's not talking about petty little things, but he's saying that if you're going to be able to stand in the midst of crisis, did you notice how Paul puts it? First of all, I, he said in verse 2 that your hearts may be assured or comforted being knit together. You're going to have to come together. You're going to have to be knit together. Praise God. You know, as they said, the first banana from the bunch is going to get peeled. So when you separate yourself from the bunch, as we already referenced in that first point, but here he's saying knit together, agreement one with another, be in a spirit of unity. Listen to me, church. If, if we fight one another within the church, how are we going to stand against the chaos outside the church? Yes. You know, somebody said that the church uh, or a lot of churches, they're in like a firing squad, but the firing squad is in a circle and we just shoot one another. But he said, come on, you know, that you, you got to you, you got to agree upon the fundamental truths of the word and you got to get in there and and let individuals be who they are as long as it doesn't go against the word of God and come up and, and be knit together with them. What a beautiful illustration of being knit together. Now, Cynthia, you know, when she has the time, she's always knitting, crocheting or 
whatever. Now, I don't know much about that, but I know about knitting. I know about how fabric is made. And basically what Paul's talking about is that you take individual strands and you interlock those individual strands to make a larger piece. And not only is it larger, but it's stronger than the individual piece itself. So as I said, separating yourself from is not going to make you stronger. It's going to make you weaker and me as well. So let's be knit together where we come and we interlink in a spiritual sense with our brothers and sisters in Christ and become a part of something that is far bigger than what we are by ourselves. Uh, even accomplishment, not only do you become stronger, but, but you can accomplish a lot more. He's talking about uh, coming together and being knit together where you will have a long, strong defense against the enemy and that he is not able to invade or come in. I want to go back to the the preacher back in Ecclesiastes and Ken's gonna gonna pull it up here and I guess I failed to mark it so let me get there Ecclesiastes chapter 4 Ecclesiastes chapter 4 ah, going right by it every time come on Rich Okay, Ecclesiastes chapter 4. And you've heard this, I'm sure, in, in verse 12. He said, and if one prevail against you, he's talking about whether you're in a fight or whether you're on the battlefield. He said, if, if you're out there fighting for the right and the, uh, the good fight of faith, if you're out there, and he's using this analogy, uh, that if it's one, uh, one individual may be able to overcome you. But two, he says, shall be able to withstand. How many knows that's true? If you're in a fight, it's better to have the odds of two against one, right? And then the writer of Ecclesiastes goes on in verse 12 and said, uh, even if you have two, but even three would be even better. Because he said, a threefold cord is not quickly broken. Now, church, we understand the wisdom of all of that. We know, you know, in the old days of the, of the ropes or even nylon ropes, you know, they are braided together. You have individual strands and then they're braided together to make uh, individual strands and then the bigger ones are are braided together and uh, regardless how many braids you have uh, it makes it stronger cable is made the same way uh, we understand that and and so when you come together when you are knit and you become one in unity not only do you become stronger but a greater line of defense I asked Ken to give us an illustration. I don't know if you've ever seen the musk ox and their line of defense against the little ones. But the, the musk ox, and, and what this uh, does not show you, is they get in a circle and they're shoulder to shoulder and their babies and young are in the middle of that circle. Some of the old and the weak and those that are vulnerable, those that are strong stand on the perimeter and those that are vulnerable are put inside. And so it doesn't matter where the wolf comes. Uh, he's not able to get to the flanks or behind. It's always somebody facing the problem head on. Can you say amen, church? That we 
need to do the same. We need to unite and come together. And when somebody is going through a crisis, we stick them in the middle and intercede and we pray for them. Because you know what? You may be on the perimeter today, but tomorrow you're going to need on the inside. Because we all go through those times from time to time. Paul said, you can make it. Yes, they're trying to get you to go back, but you can stand if you assure and encourage one another and if you will agree and have a unity and be knit together. I got to hurry on. Paul said, you can make it. You absolutely can make it without going back on your faith and Almighty God. He said, if you will have this assurance one for the other, if you have this agreement one with the other. But then thirdly, he said, if you have affection or love one for another. Did you see what he says? That you're, he didn't just say that you're knit together. You don't just take the individual pieces and connect them tightly by the power of the Holy Spirit to make one. But he said, it is being knit together and held together by love. Amen. You know, Jesus even told us that the mark that we are truly followers of Christ is a love that we have one for the other. Individuals come together and are knit together because of various things. It may be a common mission that they're passionate about. And they find each other and they have this common interest of this passion and mission and they come together. Some individuals come together and friends have been made because they enjoy the same hobby or sports or fishing or hunting or vehicles, cars or what, whatever it may be. Something that a common interest that brings you together. Some individuals have been even brought together on a far more negative note. They've gone through the same trauma. And so they get together and compare notes and uh, you've been through it, I've been through it. And they form a group together and want to encourage because we've tragically lost somebody or we have cancer or we've beat it or we're uh, striving to beat it. So individuals come together and they knit themselves together for all kinds of reasons. But I'm here to tell you this morning that the greatest glue that is going to bond two or more people together is love one for the other. I don't have time to get into all that love will do, but church, I'm, I'm not talking about the kind of love that this world promotes this world it talks about love but I don't I'm not sure that they even have the foggiest idea of what genuine authentic true love is all about when they talk about love it's more of a physical attraction it's more of a like it's more of a lust and the, and, and a big word that the Bible uses is lasciviousness which is simply a big word that that means every kind of of sexual vice uh, that that's what brings them together and when they talk about love but you see that's not what we're talking about we're talking about the love that God has loved us with and <coughs> and of course that is we've heard it agape love it's that agape love and then when Paul says here that you're by you're you're knit together uh, with love a it's that same word there. You see, when we have been recipients of God's great love, then we can in turn turn around 
and love somebody in the same way because we've experienced it already ourselves. If you really want to know what agape love is, there's, there's some words that I put together that, that kind of describes it. <coughs> agape love is spiritual love, number one. It's, it's love that comes from God. It doesn't come from man. Did you notice when Paul, we looked at verse 8 and he said, let no man spoil you. And he mentions the things. And then at the very end of the verse there, <coughs> at the very end of the verse, he said, which is not after Christ. <coughs> which is not after Christ. So a love that is not come and in the steps of and in the <coughs> blessing and receiving from the Lord is not really that genuine love at all. It's spiritual love. <laughs> <laughs> Every time I cough and then I take a breath in, I, I'm wheezing. So I am sorry. <laughs> Paul said it's supernatural. Or I'm saying it's supernatural to describe. It, it's... It's love that you could not love the people that God asked us to love in your natural love that you would have. Because Jesus tells us to love our enemies. Jesus tells us to love those that despitefully use us. Jesus tells us to love, you know, those kind of people. We can't do it by our own selves. It's a, it's a love that's supernatural that only God can lift us above the realm of natural love and put it into supernatural love where we're capable of doing that. But it's not only spiritual love and, and uh, a supernatural love, but it's sacrificial love. It's love that will go to the nth, nth degree to help or save or bless another individual of which what Jesus did when he hung on the cross. Let's move on. Wow. Paul said, going back to our text, if you're going to stand strong, you've got to have assurance, assure one another, agree, have a unity one with the other, love, affection, love one another. But there's something else, a couple more things that, I, that we need to encourage each other in. And the first one is our abundance. No, I'm not talking about material abundance. I'm talking about spiritual abundance. If you go back to our text, Paul said, um, let's see how many Ephesians, that's why, Colossians chapter 2. He said that your hearts might be comforted, assurance, be knit together, agreement, in love, affection, and unto all riches of the full assurance. And he goes on using these words that would be so applicable to them as the Greeks were so proud of the knowledge and understanding that they had. But notice he said the riches. The riches of, and if you follow that all the way through, he's talking about the riches that we have in Christ. You know, when we go through a crisis, we begin to feel sorry for ourselves and woe is me and look at me and everybody else is doing great, but look how bad I'm doing and nothing's working out on my behalf. Church, we need to encourage each other to see how, what an abundance we have in Jesus Christ. Each one of, each one of the books that Paul 
letters that he wrote has a main theme. <clears throat> and it's really back in Ephesians that the main theme is the riches in Christ. He, he says that a couple or three times. The riches that we have in Christ. Ephesians 3.8 is, is one of those. Ephesians 3, 8, unto, unto me who am less than the least of all saints to this grace given, is this grace given that I should preach among the non-Jewish, the Gentiles, and what he's going to preach, the unsearchable riches of Christ. And so we need to surround each other and say, you know, it doesn't matter what you're going through. Realize that you are a king's kid. You're not a pauper's child, but you are a king's kid. And everything that you have need of, the Lord said he would supply in Philippians chapter 4 and 19. But my God shall supply all of your need according to his riches in glory. And when he says here the unsearchable riches, what Paul is saying, you could live for God for a hundred years. You could live on the mountaintop of those hundred years, a mountaintop experience every day of that. But when you drew your last breath, you you still would have not only just scratched the surface of all that God has for you. Cynthia and I went to see Eric and Kelly and the kids, and of course, they live off of 270. And we were going by there, and I don't know if you've been by there recently, but all of these warehouses are everywhere humongous thousands of square feet and several of them on both sides of the road there on 270 and I thought about that when when we drove by there I thought God how many individual things are contained in all of those warehouse but as you go back to Philippians, Paul said, God will supply your needs according to all the warehouses on 270. No, according to his riches in his warehouse in glory. You could go through all those warehouses and I don't know how long it would take you to get each individual thing, but you could exhaust them. But you can never exhaust the riches of Christ. Amen. Honey, if you'll come, but there's one last thing. I just want to, if you go back to your text, you can make it. Whatever you individually are going through, what are we going through collectively, we can make it. And the last thing is, is, is that Paul talks about in our text. He mentions these riches, but then notice he said uh, next to the last phrase uh, that this assurance, full assurance of understanding to the acknowledgement of the mystery of God and of faith and of Christ. We need to acknowledge things to each other. We need to testify to each other. We need to confess to each other that what God has done for us in the past and how that God has encouraged us and share that with other individuals. But when you see the word mystery as it's used here, it just simply means something that was not disclosed beforehand, but now it has been revealed. And, and when, when the Bible talks about mysteries and the revealing of mysteries and that you may understand the mystery of Christ, that you may understand this plan of salvation, that you may understand God's will for your life, uh, that you may understand, uh, basically it's, uh, do you know that God shares secrets with his people? Mysteries. The world knows nothing about them. But the people of God through the Holy Spirit come to understand and to know them. 
And one of the greatest mysteries that we live in in this day is how do present day situations fit in the future events and prophecy? As somebody is, has often said, or individuals has often said, that we as Christians are not discouraged in the midst of it all. Why? Because we've read the end of the book. The Lord has led us in on a little secret. It's all going to work out. I'm coming back one of these days. So he said, stay firm, church. Stay strong. There's so many things vying for your attention to get you to turn around and go back. But Paul said, stay strong. Be strong in, in chaos, confusion. And I know that you can, and we're here to be with you, and you're here to be with Cynthia and myself, and we appreciate it. Father in heaven, I give you glory today. I ask God that you will touch and help us. And I want to thank you, Lord, for helping me to just get through this message. Praise and I'll give you 